Ever wondered why the quest for happiness and change feels like an uphill battle? Today's episode might just hold the answers you have been seeking. Join me as we delve into the teachings of a book that has revolutionized the way over 3.5 million people across the world view happiness and self. Join me in search of genuine contentment in life. Get ready to be inspired and to discover the courage to change and achieve your true happiness. Welcome to a book with bubble tea, with your host Mira He. Here, I share takeaways from East Asian books on parenting, startups, and self growth. Seeking insights beyond the typical English shelf? Want to be a better parent and achieve more in life? You are in the right place. Grab your bubble tea and let's dive in. Welcome to the new episode of A Book with Bubble Tea. This is Mira. How is everyone doing? Last night, I just came back from my ski holiday in France. Oh my goodness, the beautiful landscape of Reverty was just amazing. It always took my breath away to see such beautiful mountains, you know, tall, high, amazing. Something that I don't see often in Saudi Arabia. I just love it so much. Plus the French food, oh, it was so amazing. I feel every day I was indulging myself to the gastronomy, and I hope I haven't put on too much weight yet. All right. So for today's book, I am sure some of you must have heard of it before, or if you haven't, you must have heard my previous episode, episode five, the courage to not parent. You will definitely recognize the author, Ichiro Kishimi. Right, it's the bestseller titled "The Courage to Be Disliked," subtitled "How to Free Yourself, Change Your Life, and Achieve Real Happiness." When this book was published in Japan in 2013, it instantly became a national phenomenon. And before it was translated into English in 2018, it had already sold 3.5 million copies across Asia. Yes. So for this book, you can actually get hold of a copy in English if you fancy reading it yourself, and I will highly recommend you do because it is very interesting, and and I do think this completely changed my perspective to a lot of issues or problems I face in life. And if you think about it, it is quite interesting how a book introducing a psychologist philosophical thinking could garner so much attention. Can you believe a philosophy book becomes a bestseller? But this book is exactly that. The courage to be disliked aims to introduce to the public、uh, the thinking of a psychologist, Alfred Adler. Compared to the famous Sigmund Freud, Alfred Adler is completely underrated. Even though both of them are, you know, from Austria and were active in the same circle at the same time, Freud and Adler took very different paths in understanding human behaviors. Freud's studies show, you know, how trauma, past experiences, and our subconscious mind shape our behaviors. Whereas Eller believes none of these matter. Past experiences don't determine how we behave. Otherwise, everyone, right, sharing the same past experiences should all behave in the same way. So, to Eller, what's more important and actually most important in determining why one behaves in a certain way, which is different from one another? Is one person's desires, goals, and the courage to fuel changes. To the author Kishimi, his encounter with Eller's thinking completely changed his life. In this book, together with co-author Koga Fumitake, they aim to reveal how we can also experience transformation in our lives and how we can obtain real happiness through Eller's lenses. The book is deliberately written in、um, Socrates style, documenting dialogues between a troubled youth, just like you and me, facing loads of problems in life, and an Alarian philosopher. 
over five nights, the philosopher actually shows the youth why trauma doesn't exist, and why all problems we face in life are interpersonal relationship problems. Why it's important and necessary for us to separate other people's tasks from ourselves. And、uh, where the center of the world is, and lastly, why and how to live earnestly in the here and now, since the main focus of this book is aiming to help us find real happiness in life. So, in this episode, that's what I'm going to be focusing on, and I will be sharing three major takeaways from this book. But before we begin discussing Adler's prescription for happiness, I think it's very important to re-emphasize again that Adler does not believe in trauma or past experiences. Instead, he believes everyone always has the ability to change, and it's something we need to be very conscious about. So, if we say, "Oh, we can't change it," I can't change it. It's not because we lack the ability, but simply because we don't desire the change enough to make it happen. And most likely, it's because not changing the state of not changing actually benefit us in meeting our goals,、uh, whether we are aware of the goals or not. So, if we truly desire change, we always have a choice, and you know we can always change. Like in terms of skiing, I just don't know why I cannot tackle a black slope. For those who know skiing, black slope is the hardest slope. But after reading this book, I understand why. It's because I actually don't desire enough. I don't desire to risk my life, in my opinions, to go down a black slope. So not tackling a black slope actually benefit me. Because I don't risk my life in going down the block, in my opinion. So you know that's what Adler means. The state of not changing actually benefits us. A side note here is that choices we make and changes we desire should be made from a place of freedom. Meaning, you don't do things to please anyone or to gain approval, appraisal, or recognition from anybody. You change because you desire to change. That's why to Adler. The courage to be disliked, which is also the title of the book, is the greatest manifestation of our freedom to make choices without needing to please anyone. But Eller also reminds us that our changes should be guided by the desire to make contributions to others if we wish to achieve real happiness. And the second thing that's very important to Eller is our relationship with others. Adler's goes as far as to state that all problems we experience are interpersonal relationship problems. Every relationship involves two parties. If you think about it, it's I and the other. Therefore, in Adler's view, it is critical to know how we deal with ourselves and how we view and treat others. If we have the wrong outlook. About ourselves or others, or if we try to avoid having the necessary relationships, like you know those who are called the need group, not in education, employment, or training, then we are bound to run into many problems and feel unhappy. However, if we can deal with ourselves and others correctly, most of our problems in life will just disappear, and that's the secret to achieving real happiness. In life, can you think of some of the problems you are going through right now, and can you see how that might be a problem、uh, coming from interpersonal relationship issues? I just deal with a client this morning about his complaint on maintenance issue. Clearly, that is an interpersonal relationship issues I have to solve there. Ah, but in this episode, I'm going to share three steps from this book on how we can deal with interpersonal relationships to eliminate problems in life and reach real happiness, which is the core topic of this book. So here we go. The first takeaway is self acceptance. It might come as a bit of a surprise, but to Adler, a lot of us don't feel happy because we simply treat ourselves wrongly. I mean, it's natural for us to want to improve, right? But many of us do so by beating ourselves up, or by saying words of affirmation to ourselves to brainwash us, you know, despite our true ability. Like, I can do it, or I am the best. Adler doesn't think either of these approaches is the right way to treat ourselves. Instead, Adler proposes a different way for us to have a relationship with 
ourselves, and that is the total self acceptance. What Outler means by self acceptance is that we accept who we are now, and any changes we bring are simply built upon our current state. In the analogy that the philosopher gave to the youth, you know, we are like a piece of equipment. This equipment called I is made with certain specs, certain functionalities, capabilities, and obviously limitations as well. So,、um, for instance, if I have to give a score of the overall performance of this equipment called Mira, then I probably only score probably sixty out of one hundred. If I adopt the "I can do it" attitude, then despite the fact that I have a lot of natural limitations and I only score sixty, I nonetheless believe my natural build should be one hundred. But Adler calls this kind of self-affirmation an essentially a lie to ourselves. What Adler means by self-acceptance is not that. To him, it doesn't really matter how high or low I score as an equipment. Doesn't bother me or doesn't bother him. This is just where I am now. The most important thing to Adler is our goal and how we can use this equipment that it's called ourselves to get closer to score one hundred. So if you only score sixty, but you want to do something as great as ninety, then how do you continue to improve yourself so you can score ninety? If ninety is your goal, so your current state that score only sixty. Doesn't matter. All it matters is your goal and how you use this machine, like this equipment of yourself, to achieve a、um, higher score. So there is no judgment about me, no emotional beat up, no need to pump ourselves with lies and delusion. All we need to do is simply accept our current specs, let go of things we cannot change, like my height or my race. And then we bring improvements to how we can use our equipments. You know, this machine of called ourselves. Then we will get closer to one hundred. Even if we seem inferior to others at the moment, doesn't matter. I couldn't agree with Adler more on this point. In fact, I came、uh, to the same realization a long time ago, probably around ten years ago, when I was tasked with writing a London travel book. That project confronted me with my incapability to be meticulous about details. I'm just so bad at it. I easily made spelling mistakes, attached like wrong names to wrong shops, listed wrong street names, or incorrect working hours. But hey, I wanted to write a great guidebook. So instead of beating myself up for something I really couldn't change, or You know, giving myself false affirmation that I can be more careful with details. I can't do it. What I did was I simply devised some proofreading strategies. So I would focus on proofreading one type of information at a time, and I would go over the book multiple times to proofread it. Like you know, the first round of proofreading, I will only focus on names of shops. The second round only on opening hours. The third round only on prices, etc. You got the point. By doing so, I managed to produce a quality draft of the guidebook for the publisher, and I believe I could only accomplish the goal because I first accepted myself, my incapabilities, and worked with them to reach the goal. So that is the first takeaway: self acceptance. The second takeaway is confidence in others. Adler believes that many people feel unhappy even after achieving worldly success, because they believe they live in a world of competition, and the world is dangerous place full of enemies who watch you and seek any opening to attack you. But if we take a step back, is that really true? Do other people really watch you so closely and want for any opportunities to attack you? You know, like when we were a teenager, right? Like we probably were so conscious about our pimples. I remember I just couldn't help but think the whole world was staring at my pimples. Some mean people would certainly make fun of my pimples behind me. Sometimes I just couldn't bear the thought of how unattractive I must look. But you know, when I grew older, probably by having more important responsibility in life, 
I just really couldn't care less about my pimples anymore. I mean, I even have the shiny silver braces on my teeth, right? Let alone of just some few pimples here and there. And once I let go of it, I realized no one cares. So, what was my mental torture about previously then? Why was I living under fear of attack, judgment, and criticism? Adler said, "If we can consider other people as our enemies, why can't we consider them as our comrades instead? Comrades are people who will support us whenever we are in need. If we can change the way we see other around us." A lot of the stress, anxieties, and problems we face would actually just naturally go away, and by then we will be able to truthfully be happy for other people's achievements and accomplishments, and we shall also have the courage to build relationships with other people as well. I really think this concept of seeing other people as my comrades instead of enemies will really truly change me because I notice now that I have this tendency of seeing other people either as my enemies or competition, or people's default setting is like they don't like me. So even if they do show their affections toward me, I just assume this is not going to last long. And now I have realized how harmful it is、um, from you know building relationship with other people by holding this viewpoint because it prevented me from having profound and intimate relationship with others. I would just naturally hold back and withdraw myself. But now seeing what Adler said, I think it really brought to my awareness. Ah, this is the thing that was holding me back from other people. All right. However,、um, when it comes to interacting with other people. Our perspectives toward them are not enough. We need more practical guidance here. And the core principle to Adler's、uh, psychology or philosophical thinking is this separation of tasks when we are dealing with people. When we interact with other people, especially with our beloved ones, like our kids, spouses, we often overextend our responsibilities to things that are. Not our task, really. These are not our business. Like whether our kids study or not, it's not our task to ensure because study benefits the kids, not us. However, as parents, we often scold them for not studying, driving them around for private tutoring, getting them to finish day-to-day -day homework. But this kind of intrusion. Of ourselves into other people's tasks is precisely the root of all evils in our interpersonal relationships. In fact, the author says in the book, and here's the quote: "In general, all interpersonal relationship troubles are caused by intruding on other people's tasks or having one's own tasks intruded on. Carrying out the separation of tasks is enough to change one's interpersonal relationships dramatically." End quote. When dealing with others, we need to constantly ask ourselves, "Whose task is this?" and continually separate one's own task from other people's task. This is very difficult when we are dealing with our beloved ones, but it's necessary. I actually heard a story from a friend who skied with us this year. She said when she was fifteen, she got her first boyfriend, and everyone could tell he was not a good guy. She fell for him because he was older and he liked her. I mean, this obviously worried her father tremendously. But instead of scolding her or forcing her to break up or banning her from seeing the boy again, the father decided to sit back and trust his daughter. You know, she would come back to her senses sooner or later. And he knew also if he intruded, his teenage daughter probably would fall for this guy even more. And he was right. Very soon, she parted their ways. Years later, my friend's father told her that he was terrified, but he's glad he made the right choice. The third takeaway is the contribution to others. In our quest for happiness, the philosopher shares Aller's answers to this age-old philosophical questions. I mean, do you hear my dog like <laughs> outside of my recording studio? Oh. <laughs> This is also a question that lingers in everyone's mind. To Adler, the answer actually lies in us, shifting the focus from ourselves to other people. And our happiness comes from when we feel that we are of use to someone. 
It gives our greatest sense of happiness, and this contribution doesn't even need to be visible or recognized by others. All we need is just the subjective sense that, yes, I am of use to someone, or in other words, a feeling of contribution. And that's all. That's enough for our happiness. And happiness, in fact, according to the Adler's thinking, is the feeling of contribution. So, to be happy. One needs to feel that he or she is of use to someone, and this is, you know, our self worth. However, one thing to be very careful of is we should be mindful of seeking recognition from others as a way to validate whether we are truly of use to someone or not, because this way of gaining a sense of self worth through others' recognition actually gives away our freedom, and in the long run. One will have no choice but to walk through life in accordance with other people's wishes, and real happiness can never, never, ever be obtained when there is no freedom in making our choices. Therefore, how we gain the feeling of "I am used to someone" is purely subjective, and only then we can obtain happiness. This sense of making contribution to others is very important to Adlerian psychology. In the book, the philosopher actually refers to it as our guiding star. As long as we have this "I contribute to others" kind of mindset, we will never lose our way, and we can do whatever we like, whether we are being disliked or not. We can pay it no attention, and we can live freely. So,、uh, if I sum up. About how to be happy, the fundamental layer is actually knowing I can be happy at this moment now, as long as I choose to. I accept myself and do not seek others' approval or recognition. I see others as my comrades instead of enemies, and the path to real happiness is through subjectively knowing that I am of use to others and I am making my contribution. Last part is my thoughts. When I first read about this book, I really thought that Larian psychology is about having the courage to do whatever I want and don't mind about anyone else. Isn't that how I could possibly be disliked? And the whole thing of separation of task also sound a bit cold to me, doesn't it? Like this is your own business, get it sorted yourself. You know why should I help you? That kind of thing. But how wrong was I when I read it again for the second time? I missed out a huge part that Adler actually emphasized on making the contribution to others, and this subjective sense of contribution to other people, feeling that I am of use to someone, even no one recognizes it, not only leads us to real happiness, it should also further. You know, be our guiding star, so it guides our decision of choice when we make in life. I can certainly see why this book has been a big hit in Japan and everywhere else. Though I still think, you know, the way that Adler thought about past trauma and past experiences don't matter. But I really still believe that this approach can also reveal a lot of things that maybe we are not consciously aware of. Because without knowing how past experiences impact us, and just rushing into changing ourselves, sounds to me a bit like driving a broken car. But instead of trying to repair it first, the driver just gears up or does a turn because the driver believes, "Yes, I can. I can always make a choice. I can always change it." I still think that you know. I probably would go with a more like a hybrid approach. I go for maybe a counselor to try to reveal things maybe I don't even know that I have a problem with. But you know, definitely adopt the Adler's thinking of believing that yes, I have a choice here. I can always make a decision of my behavior, and I think these hybrid approach will really benefit us. Will benefit me in terms of having a practical solutions in changing my life. As well as knowing what might be the blind spots of my behaviors that I didn't even know about. Saying that, I think this book offers a practical, instantaneous way that we can experience life changes. From this book, we know we are never as helpless as we think, and no one can force us to make any decision. There are always choices available to me to make a difference. 
and I have the ability to make the changes. I do recommend anyone who wants to experience a breakthrough. I think this book will truly help you greatly. All right, that's the episode for today, and I hope you like it. If you do, please subscribe, follow us,、uh, subscribe our podcast, and now we also have a YouTube as well. I would like to see your comments, and I would love to learn stuff and grow it together with you. Let's enjoy our bubble tea. Until next week, bye.